Welcome back to the channel, guys. I hope everyone is doing well. I can see there's quite a few people here in the live chat. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to uh, my guest joining me today. He has been on the show before and it's always a fascinating conversation. So if any of you guys watching in the live chat do have a question, then please pop it in capital letters. I'll do my best to ask it or at least highlight it and potentially save it for a later point in the interview. So yeah, let's let's just get straight to it. Um, like I said, this is a returning guest, and uh, this is going to be great. So please welcome back, Doctor Michael Masters. Mike, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Benny? It's good to see you. Yeah. Again. You too, my friend. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. I think the first thing I'd like to do is just, um, as you're a professor of biological anthropology, I'd like to know, in your opinion, of what the main links are between anthropology in general and the UFO subject. Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, uh, I, I could identify a few. One in particular is uh, our, our method of approaching questions like this. Um, you know, obviously, this phenomenon doesn't lend itself to strict scientific rigor, application of the scientific method, hypothesis testing, standards of evidence, things like that. So we, we've been limited in this field from uh, really the beginning, but mostly since the 70s, once some rules went into place to protect human subjects, which was obviously a good thing. Um, so we can't experiment on humans. We have to use methods that allow us to uh, observe and study and try to develop hypotheses that can be tested with observational data, which is still, you know, it's a rigorous scientific pursuit. Um, you don't you don't have cause and effect in the same way that you can isolate all variables in a laboratory setting, but we can account for a number of variables and try to come up with uh, explanations for things that are based on on sound data and sound results from analyzing that data. So I, I think that's useful. Um, I try to uh, use that approach in my last book, The Extra Tempestrial Model, uh, drawing from an abductive approach where you try to make inference to the best explanation based on uh, the things that you can observe and look for patterns across those those things, the phenomenon as a whole, really. Um, but then also, like my my main approach since the beginning has been looking at the physiology, the evolution of our morphological form, um, which was a big part of why I'm drawn to this time travel explanation because the main trends in human evolution are are expanding neurocortex, our expanding brain, uh, also the change in shape where it moves out over our eyes and expands mediolaterally, which occurs in concert with our mid and lower facial anatomy shrinking back. All of that has occurred in association with us standing upright, walking bipedally. So if we look at that trend over the last six to eight million years, project that forward, uh, we are likely to look more and more like these, what I think are, are more distant evolutionary descendants, these quintessential gray alien forms with a very large uh, neurocortex, large eyes, small faces, still upright walking, still pentadactyl, still tetrapods. So I, I think the biological side helps understand those evolutionary trends when talking about the beans, but then also the way we can approach this with anthropological methods, uh, I believe can be useful for really trying to understand the behaviors, um, looking at patterns across reports with regard to the behavior of the craft, the beans, the things that they're reported doing. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of broad applications for anthropological research with regard to the, the UFO question. Yeah, interesting. Now, you, you uh, the first time you came on the show, I think you just had the one book out, which was uh, Identified Flying Objects, which I think was published in 2019. And obviously, since then, you just mentioned the extratempestrial model. So you able to talk us through how your theory evolved from book one through to book two? Yeah, quite a lot, actually. Um, <clears throat> and, and really, a lot of it was just overlooking things, not really knowing the right questions to ask. And that, that's how it is with any scientific pursuit. You're constantly evolving your perception as more information and more data becomes available. So in the first book, it was mostly rooted in this anthropological approach, not just looking at the physical form of these beings, but also the craft themselves and how the form of these crafts seems to indicate the function of backward time travel. Uh, which was a main theme in the second book as well. 
but then also drawing from astrobiology, astronomy, and physics, because any one field can't help explain all of the nuances of what's going on here. So it was really uh, an attempt at a multidisciplinary approach, but mostly focusing on what we know about what life on other planets might look like, uh, potential problems with beings developing, evolving on a different planet with all of these different variables that shape their own evolutionary history, problems with getting between different star systems or even finding life on other star systems. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, obviously tying in the physics of time, time travel, what little we know about time and how that might work from our current present. Um, and then, yeah, just really trying to wrap it all together to make a case for why we should consider this time travel theory. But I, I definitely didn't dive too deep into the UFO question itself, and especially not with regard to the, uh, the abduction, the close encounters, which was more of the focus for the second book, The Extra Tempestrial Model, which really tried to look across a number of different case studies. I think in total, there were close to 25 or 30, but mostly focusing on 15 individual, well-vetted, well-understood cases that don't just adhere to this time travel model, but also ones that you know, show some variation, throw some wrenches in those cogs as well, because it's important to consider all of the evidence. And um, yeah, just highlighting some things I overlooked with regard to the, f the first book, just things I didn't know that people pointed out to me, um, seemingly obvious things like the role of AI, the role of genetic modification in the human future, uh, disease transmission, and um, the way that this, the manipulation of time might help explain the G-forces. And what we see is, you know, 10,000 Gs might be nothing to them just because of the difference in the way time and space and the, the flow of time are perceived within and then outside of that craft. So things like that, um, just the, the way the conversations evolved, I wanted to sort of take a different approach, but still bring in a number of those things that I learned going from the first to the second book. Yeah, thank you. And there's a few things you said there that I have got sort of on my list to talk about. So I'm going to start by asking how you account for things like paradoxes, timeline effects, timeline changes, the butterfly effect. Uh, I saw someone here in the live chat put the grandfather paradox. How do you account for all of those when discussing the uh, the time travel part of things? Well, they're kind of moot, to be honest. There really are no paradoxes if you conceptualize this phenomenon in the context of the block universe model, because there is no change. It's really only once you interject that, that issue of change that you start to get paradoxes. And within the block universe, there, there is no ability to change anything because all moments from the very beginning to the very end of time and space and all matter within this universe are already accounted for in this massive four-dimensional block of every moment that every particle has ever experienced. So in moving in and around that 4D block, you're not changing anything. You're just doing what you had already done. It doesn't matter if it's before or after you're present. All of it is going to be the past to someone in your future, and nothing's going to change. They're just going to see the interlinking of all of these different events that were always linked. It's just when you interject your consciousness into it and the way we perceive the flow of time, it feels like something that you're doing in the past is in your future. But really, it's it's already in the past. It already exists there as those structured moments in the block universe. You're just going to do the thing that's already been done. And once you do it, you come back. It's now in your past. It was the same as it ever was. Nothing changes. There's no paradoxes. It's only once you get into the the many worlds interpretation or these multiverses or multiple timelines that you start to run into that question of paradox where you can't actually have a change that affects something in a different way and this butterfly effect and you would come back to a different timeline where everything's fundamentally different but the most um, conventional explanation for time is the block universe model among philosophers and physicists and everyone who studies time and it just makes the most sense and um, you know, it, it, it's important to recognize that that may not be the case. You know, we, we don't know really what time is fundamentally. We think it's an emergent phenomenon. There's something much more fundamental that we haven't yet accounted for. And once we do, we may have to revisit that. But what I did was just try to take what we know now 
and apply that knowledge to this question. But obviously, you know, as more information presents itself, we may have to change that. But honestly, the, the block universe model landscape time, it does make the most sense. And um, I think it does help really explain what's happening and how they're moving about the, the past and you know our future and their past without really interjecting any major changes. I don't think it's really a factor that we need to to worry about too much. Yeah. And then you mentioned um, AI as well in there. So could these beings, and like what relation could there be between AI? Could it be like an artificial biological intelligence? Like where does that fit in, in, in what you've looked at? I think it's certainly a possibility. I mean, we're, we're already doing it. We're already making things that are looking more and more like fully functional automatons and, and doing them in our own image too. I mean, that's something that we would expect to do, not just for the sex robot industry, which I think probably is a driver in a lot of this and sex drives a lot of things, but just because we are this, we know what we are and to make something that can help us having the same physiological form as us will allow it to do many of the same things. So I think we will probably create uh, AI robots in our form, uh, at least something that looks similar to us and maybe is indistinguishable from us that could perform some of the tasks that they do, especially the more dangerous tasks and abductions like, like Whitley Strieber when he was abducted from his cabin in New York described a, a robot like droid that looked very much like these shorter grays coming at him. And, um, you know, I, I think it made him fall back asleep or something. I forget the exact details, but then, then you have in the Pascagoula case, uh, with Parker and Hickson where it's a full on robot. It doesn't really look like a human at all it had like antennas and elephant skin and just kind of floated, but there were humans on that ship. Calvin mm -hmm. Parker described seeing fully formed modern humans, just like us on that ship. So that may be a case where they sent this thing out to do the dirty work for him, especially with two full grown men are freaked out about what's happening. You would expect that. Um, one other thing I've been thinking about recently with regard to AI too, is, is how it might not be a coincidence that uh, this seemingly different path toward disclosure. And obviously you could argue that we've been down this road many times and we start to get glimpses that we get pulled back. But this one, if it is different, it does seem to correlate with a very rapid evolution of our artificial intelligence technology. And you can't help but wonder if that might be something that signals to these visitors that, wow, they're, they're making something that's more intelligent than themselves. You know, like how, as far as looking for cues as to whether or not we might be ready for contact or disclosure or whatever you want to call it, if we start making something that's arguably as intelligent or more intelligent than us, I, I don't know what other red flag you could throw up that's going to indicate that. So, yeah, I don't know if that's a coincidence or if there's something behind that, but I do find it an interesting correlate. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned Whitley Strieber there, and, and you know, there's been a lot of really well a lot of abduction stories both big cases that we know about and, and then thousands of others and you know if these entities are coming back in time and abducting people why do you think that might be in your sort of speculative opinion what are they what are they what could they be doing well i think it's multifaceted they're probably doing it for a lot of different reasons um there's the obvious one that you know i always try to to throw out my my own biases where they seem to be doing the same thing I would do as an anthropologist, especially a biological paleoanthropologist, where they're trying to learn about their distant past, study the physiology, the genetics, the, you know, the teeth, the skin, the blood. Um, and that does seem to be a part of it. But then you also have reports. I, I highlighted a couple in my most recent book where they seem to be uh, very clearly focused on the ecology of Earth. So studying the life forms, uh, they explicitly stated to a couple contactees that they're studying uh, toxicity and environmental degradation because we're getting ourselves deeper in trouble, as they said. And then again, why would they care if this isn't their Earth too, if they don't have it after us? If they have their own planet somewhere else, it's hard to argue why they would necessarily be doing any of those things or why they would even care. 
But then I think probably the main one has to do with uh, our, our genetics, our DNA, and most likely their DNA too, because that is arguably one of the most um, prolific or ubiquitous aspects of this phenomenon is that they're picking people up and taking sperm from males, um, eggs from females, growing fetuses and extracting those in females, um, but also using exogenesis chambers. It's reported a lot, especially in these large triangular craft or the large triangular craft if there is only one, where there's reports of these long rows of incubating fetuses that look very human, um, but with slightly bigger eyes, bigger heads. So, you know, there's a lot of questions that would obviously stem from that. What's the reasoning behind that? Why are they doing it? Exactly. How are they doing it? From what time periods are they sampling gametes and using those gametes? What's the purpose of these hybrids? What's their role in this whole thing? But that is arguably one of the most likely the most important things that they're doing. And then as far as why, you know, maybe that plays in. I talked about this a lot in my second book, and especially with regard to the question of the many worlds interpretation, different timelines or the block universe is what if there is a coming apocalypse or catastrophe, which is something we've been discussing in this space for a couple of years. Uh, Frank Milburn and Ross Colthart have been talking about this a lot, and it is something to consider. And if that is the case, one would expect that we would see exactly that, that we would see our, our future descendants or anyone who cares about uh, the human genome coming and taking a lot of our genes prior to a huge bottleneck where you have a number of those uh, genes disappear, where you have relatively little genetic variation after a number of humans die relative to a broad range of genetic variation in the human genome prior to that, that cataclysm. So I think, I think that's something to keep in mind too um, and may help explain why there's such a focus, an intense focus on, on chromosomes. But I list a number of other reasons outside the cataclysm idea as to why they may be doing that. Simple trends that we can see throughout human history with regard to infertility, reduced fecundity, um, just people choosing to have fewer children, toxicity in our environment. We see a 50% decrease in sperm counts over the last 50 years, 60% decrease in the last 40 years among individuals in the Western world, which are more polluted in many ways. Um, so just, you know, any number of things that might help explain that. But I do think the cataclysm one is, is something to keep on the table too. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned in there about genes and DNA. Do you think in the sort of early evolution of Homo sapien and possibly even other hominid species that there may have been some type of manipulation potentially by these entities? It's possible. I mean, I don't know how I don't know how we can necessarily identify that that it's it's recent that we've even become aware of the fact that we could extract ancient DNA from some of our uh, direct ancestors or closely related ones like Neanderthals. But but there's a number of limitations and polymerase chain reaction can help you sort of get a bigger sample, but there's issues with contamination and just not having a represented genome. You only have certain aspects of the genome, so you can't really map the entire thing and see what anomalies might be there. But at some point, maybe we'll be able to answer that question. I, I try not to speculate too much about what they're doing to us. I think it's more about what they're doing for themselves. I think that the DNA they take from us uh, is to help them more than it is to necessarily change us or do something to us. Yeah, I think I'm just going to jump to a couple of questions from the, the live chat here. Mr. Calhoun, uh, with the five euro donation as well, you might have answered this one in there, but it said... Could we detect time travelers by the biological microbiotic contamination some may have accidentally caused? Yeah, possibly. But I do think from reports I've read, they go out of their way to ensure there is not any sort of disease transmission or contamination. Um, I highlight a number of cases in the extratempestral model where they make anyone that comes on the ship either strip naked go through this decontamination chamber and put on clothes that they give them or, you know, like like with um, Antonio Villas-Boas, how he was stripped naked, wiped down in this 
probably antiseptic type solution. So, I mean, it's the same thing with chimpanzees. We, we wear masks around chimpanzees and, you know, we ensure that we're not communicable with some virus or bacteria because as our closest living relative, disease transmission is much more likely to happen between us, which is where we got HIV as an example, and many other zoonotic diseases that come from other animals like pigs. We're closely related to pigs or at least have similar genetics. So we can uh, get more diseases with them. Uh, bats being mammals with rabies, whereas birds can't carry that. So the closer you are to an individual, and maybe this is another indication that they're human too, that they do seem to be more concerned about interjecting um, any sort of negative virus, bacteria, parasite. It's not likely they have parasites in the future, but um, any of those things. So I, I think it's probably something they're cautious of, and I don't think it's likely to happen. But I mean, they crash the hell out of these craft too. So clearly they're infallible and uh, <laughs> not perfect with everything. So something could always slip through the cracks. Yeah, for sure. Uh, question here from Yin Yang. What does Dr. Masters think of the infamous slide nine and its implications? Slide nine. Uh, I don't know what that is. All oh, right. Know. So in the, the original A tip slides, there was a, a slide nine with a list of things. Was that the like the five observables? Was that the no, same? No, it was kind was of something thing? similar along those lines. It was a list of of certain uh, things that they kind of were looking into during A tip. But hey, if uh, you're not familiar with it, that's fine. You know, no, I'll, I'll send you it. I'll, I'll send you it on that one. I'll send it you later after the interview. To yeah, take we'll it. look into it. It's, I always do try to follow up on stuff I don't know about. Slow yeah, down. it's it's definitely interesting. I'll tell you that, definitely. So cool. um, another one for Mr. Calhoun. And again, thank you so much for your generous donation. Um, Dolan's alien agendas vaguely implies that an ancient human group may have been abducted and evolved instead into the greys based on Dr. C. Clement's work and partly DNA from P. Corey's case. Thoughts? have been abducted and evolved. Um, yeah, I haven't read that book, so I don't know exactly. But based on the question, I mean, if that's related to the whole sort of uh, like splitting off divergent human group, which I, I hear a lot um, and have more recently, I don't, I'm not sure why. There's probably something that happened that made people talk about that more but um yeah the way that was phrased is something i might consider more than the way it's usually uh articulated where you have this ancient human group that goes underground or some cataclysm happens and they leave earth somehow or evolve on a different planet all, all of that it kind of seems like ridiculous garbage to me because for for a couple of reasons. One is that there's no evidence of that archaeologically. Maybe we'll find something someday, at which point I would reassess my somewhat critical stance on this. Um, the other problem, and this is a very important one, is that simple always comes before complex. With compounding culture, you have this foundation and each subsequent generation builds a, upon that foundation. It's one of the most basic principles of cultural evolution. So there's really no way unless, and as your your viewer seemed to indicate, unless you have another extraterrestrial civilization come and abduct people and then, you know, whatever can happen. I think that's one of the only ways this can happen. Or if you have a future human population that is more advanced, where you do still have simple coming before complex and that compounding cultural knowledge evolving into the future, if they came back and jumped over our present, then you could have very complex individuals who technically originated in our future existing in our simple past. And they could even set up, you know, a whole civilization there. Uh, they might want to, especially considering what we've been doing to this planet, be more pristine and be more natural. So, you know, you could have an Atlantis. You could have a really highly complex civilization that, that existed as a complex entity before us, but only because they originated from a more complex future. So I see if that is the case, I see the only real possibilities is not that you had an offshoot per se, um, because we would see that in the archaeological record, 
um, or even if they're living underground, which I've heard before, like you're not developing spaceships underground. You need to be able to test those and fly them and see if they work. So, so that really makes no sense as far as a, an actual direct offshoot. But if you did have extraterrestrials coming here, taking people from our past, doing whatever on their planet or here in secrecy, that's a possibility. But that also adds another assumption that also adds this question of extraterrestrial life and advanced extraterrestrial life meddling with us. The simpler explanation might be us because we know we're here and we are going from simple to complex where they come back and, and set up shop in the past. And, you know, maybe that helps explain the crypto terrestrials too, why you have people that, that look just like us, but possess the clairvoyance and the telepathy and the future knowledge because they came from the future mm -hmm. and they have that and they retain those characteristics while still physiologically looking just like us. So, uh, you know, if, if people think they're walking amongst us, which there's definitely evidence for that, then I think that that future to past transmission of culture, knowledge, and physical entities could help explain that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you mentioned, again, humans. We've talked about greys and robotic AI, but how do you consider descriptions of non-hominid type entities such as mantis beings or insectoids? Yeah, I think if they do have six legs, then we should consider the possibility that we're dealing with insects. But from what I've seen, they still are tetrapods they still have four limbs and lower limbs uh, legs as we call them and upper legs what we call arms so if they do have that same configuration which is ubiquitous among all mammals and most you know non-mammalian life forms too that aren't insects then we do still need to consider whether or not they are earthly tetrapods just like us um you know if, but if they do have six limbs and they have claws and things like that then yeah we're definitely not talking about a hominin form my my personal take is that once we get so far into the future we're just going to start looking less and like less and less like ourselves i mean even when europeans got on boats and started traveling around they weren't sure the humans they were coming into contact with were even humans they came up with all these cockamamie ideas about how they're a separate creation of god or you know whatever they used to try to justify acts of ultra violence against them but they didn't even recognize our humanity and these people that look exactly like us except for some slight differences in skin color and hair color and texture and things like that so you know, I, I do wonder if it's that same sort of thing just projected into the future, where once your eyes get big enough, um, especially if they're wearing some kind of contact lens, like a darkened lens, because with huge eyes, you would want to shelter them from light to some extent, then, yeah, I mean, you could see how we might look like a praying mantis in that regard. Um, but if they are walking on two legs with two arms, then I think it's hard to argue that they are an actual insect. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, I just wanted to flip it sort of around to sort of the science a little bit more um, or the scientific community. And it seems like we're seeing a lot more scientists looking into this subject. So I'd just like to see, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Do you see the stigma sort of dropping in the sort of scientific community and academia? Oh, yeah, for sure. And it's uh, it's great to see. Honestly, it's it's a very welcome sight. Um yeah, I just I wrote a whole article about that for the MUFON uh, journal. I think it was the March edition when it came out. Just talking about my own experience and kind of what I've seen over the last four or five years with regard to how the subject's been perceived um, in academia and how academics have been perceived uh, who study this. And it all seems to be moving in a positive direction. I mean, I can only talk about my own personal experience, but it has been quite, quite encouraging, to be honest, from, you know, the first time I told the chair of my department that I was working on this book back in 2017, I think it was, he looked at me and said, yeah, I mean, that's what scientists are supposed to be doing. And then just kind of made a face like, why the hell are we even having this conversation and walked away? Like, yeah, of course you should be doing that. It's our job. And it is our job. I mean, we're supposed to be investigating the mysterious aspects of the universe and, you know, and asking questions, investigating things to the best of our ability. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got asked to teach an honors course at my university about this research, about UFOs, about my book specifically. I got a 
a scholarship and research award from the dean of uh, my university last spring, right before I went on sabbatical. Uh, got a merit award for scholarship and research just a month or so ago while I was on sabbatical. Um, you know, each of my book covers are up in the main lobby of my building. They sell my books at the bookstore, the university bookstore. So I, I have been very encouraged by my institution, by my academic colleagues. And if that's my experience, I would assume it's the experience of others, too. Um, I mean, I obviously waited till I had tenure and full professor status before I really uh, hit the ground running with this just to make sure those protections are in place. And at this point, I would encourage others to do that, too. I don't know if an early stage scientist, you know, a, a visiting professor, associate or assistant professor would really want to stick their necks out without those protections. But I don't know. I, I see I see encouraging trends. And and yeah, obviously, having more academics get into the space is, is great. I I think the knowledge and skills that we can bring to the table are, are only going to help. I don't see how they could detract. Yeah, no, it certainly is encouraging. And uh, congratulations on those those awards. And and so being, you know, quite open in the UFO subject, has that led to you being invited to sort of different events, regard, you know, related to the subject? And, and if so, any kind of standout events that you can talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... You know, there's a lot of great UFO conferences, and, and those were arguably happening before a lot of really academic conferences, or if not before, at least in higher numbers. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I've, I've been fortunate to have been invited to a couple just in the last year. Um, one put on by Jeff Kripal at Rice University, opening of the archives, which was a phenomenal, I would call it historic what they did there. Um, I got to be on a panel with a number of prominent researchers. Um, Aaron Prophet, I remember a professor at University of Florida, Eric Wargo, who's written arguably the book on precognition called Time Loops, which I'd recommend everybody read. Um, and that was a fantastic event. Jacques Vallée, uh, Leslie Kane, Whitley Strieber, so many great speakers. Um, Edwin May, the head of the Stargate project for the CIA gave really interesting talk and, and, and countless others as well. Um, and then in July, I got to give a talk at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, again, with a number of uh, prominent PhDs in various fields related to all kinds of stuff, philosophy, uh, history, history of philosophy, parapsychology, a lot of those kind of under the radar fringe type fields, but just um, really being able to to give a talk in very academic terms, you know, you never want to be too esoteric when going on a podcast or, or giving a talk to a UFO community, but being in a room full of academics, we could all kind of go just a little bit deeper. And actually, the inspiration for my most recent book came from that. Uh, one of the co-founders of the Esalen Institute, a guy named Michael Murphy, came up to me after my talk, and he was like, man, I was I was done with this really great guy. Really, uh, I think he's like 93, but he seems like he's in his 50s. It's crazy. But he was like, you know, I was done with UFOs. I, I thought I'd heard everything. I'd seen everything and it just didn't make any damn sense. But your your presentation, you know, the future humans, this, this kind of makes sense. And I uh, really appreciate you spelling all this out. And then asked me if uh, if I if there's any really deep dives into uh, sex and music. Like with regard to the way the visitors interact with us, future humans, as I would argue. And I got back from that and I started looking and I couldn't really find anything that really went deep into the sex aspect in music specifically. There's obviously cases where people do report having sex. And, and that was a big, um, a big motivator for writing this, this book, which one of my reviewers called she called me the Danielle Steele of, <laughs> of UFO research or something. That's a very sex sexual book. Uh, also focuses on music and culture and things like that, which you know stemmed from hey, why 
you know, if, if the gametes are so important, if sex and sexuality is so important, why aren't we talking about that more? So mm. it's obviously, you know, it's a satirical science fiction novel, but really does try to draw in all of these same things from my previous two books. Um, but that's that's definitely a main theme, uh, largely thanks to Michael Murphy. Yeah, and this is your, your new book. You mentioned Revelation, the future human past. So was it always something you'd wanted to do is sort of write a fiction book around this subject? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Like I, I kind of saw this as, as sort of a three-part thing where there's okay. the first book is kind of the more hard science, dense, uh, deep dive into the these four different fields I mentioned earlier. But it, it's been called dense. It's more of a hard read, especially if you're not familiar with a lot of these terms. But I, I did, you know, but I had three PhD reviewers to make sure it appealed to my academic colleagues, but also a number of beta readers to make sure it appealed to everyone. It was readable, but I, it is, I agree with that critique that it is somewhat dense. Whereas the second book um, is much more readable, it's stories and it's this is what happened to people. Then I bring that science in to sort of highlight how we might understand these patterns that exist across these various case studies. And then, yeah, this one is kind of that last piece where people that really aren't into science at all, but are still interested in maybe how this time travel model might be understood in the context of a, a purely fictitious story that may actually have more truth in it than a lot of people realize, um, but is very readable, sort of um, a, a funny, highly sexual look at the uh, the phenomenon in the context of this future human hypothesis. Oh, that's amazing. I can't I can't wait to read it. It looks amazing. And it looks physically amazing with a very standout cover as it well. It does. Yeah, they killed <laughs> it on the cover. Uh, 33 ounce creative. Is that what the OZ stands for? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Dan and Olaf with. Um, yeah, they, they made me two covers and it was really hard to pick which one I was going to use. But one, they took some creative liberties with one of them that were were puff perfect i i kind of wonder if they got a sneak peek at the manuscript honestly <laughs> it was it was a little too good what they did um but yeah no they they knocked it out of the park i'm i'm as excited about the cover as i am the book itself they did a great job yeah excellent excellent um just switching back again to sort of more sort of the uh theories let's say have you considered a, a shadow biosphere or shadow biome concept when it comes to this subject yeah, I mean, it, that kind of plays into the whole um, breakout civilization thing to some extent. But I just, I don't know. I mean, if there is a shadow biome that is as complex and advanced and sophisticated as us, which I think when you're talking about the UFO phenomenon, it would have to be because yeah. they're clearly more advanced than us, then I do think that's a little more tenuous just because we would see that more it's harder to hide but you know there could absolutely be something on the the molecular level that might represent that and i mean we, you're talking about a lot of anecdotes and a lot of speculation is that one of the hardest parts about combining your research and work with the ufo subject or it, if it's not what is the sort of the hardest part about researching and writing about this subject for you I mean, I think that's a stereotype, yeah, that anytime you're talking about the future it has to be speculation. But I, th I think that's actually a misnomer and it's sort of unfortunate that people just default to that because in this particular case, if we are talking about the future and we're actually seeing the craft and the beans coming back from that future, it's not speculation at all. Right. It's not speculating about what we're going to be. It's actual observational research, which at the top of the show, I said, is kind of our forte. That's what we do in mm. anthropology is observational research because we can't experiment on humans. So it is kind of annoying when I hear that because it's, it's not speculation if you are quantifying and trying to understand the things that you're seeing that it doesn't matter if they come from our future or past, if they're present in our reality, our current present, then you can do observational studies the same way you can with anything else. Um, the same way we have fossils um, from the past. We see them in our present. They've lost the soft tissue, obviously, but we can still use what we see to make educated guesses about what happened between now and then. So, and I really, I, I hit this hard in my first book is that I did try to avoid 
anything that could be considered just unabated speculation where we're saying, well, we look like that because this happened and that caused us to have this physical characteristic or these behaviors. I, I really steered away from that and try to just stick to dominant trends throughout the hominin past and how those might correlate with what we do actually observe in these craft and the beans themselves. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of a knee jerk reaction that a lot of people have, but if, if they are from the future and they are here in our present, then that's not speculation, it's observation. Yeah. And when I mentioned there as well about anecdotes and anecdotal evidence, i.e. stories from experiences, I think that's been, it's been looked over a bit too much in my in my opinion you know people say well it's just it's just a story we'll we'll kind of brush it aside so you know i believe that experiences stories should definitely be heard and respected and, and taken seriously so it seems like you agree with that yeah yeah and if you have enough of them then it's content analysis it's that mm. abductive approach i mentioned earlier if you're just looking at one or two yeah that's anecdote but if you start really going deep into a number of these and and with big data and possibly ai we might be able to really accumulate a massive database that allows us to do content analysis over thousands and thousands of cases. And you you do have people doing that, like with the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free study. I mean, they have upwards of 5,000 individuals now, multicultural, multilinguistic study, where they're using surveys, which is also a valid form of uh, research. And, you know, there's there's always issues with surveys, but that's not anecdote anymore. Now you're seeing statistically what people most commonly report and to tie it into what we were talking about earlier with the, the, the insects, the reptilians, things like that, that research has shown that that's only about 5% and not just those two, but every other thing that's not a tall gray, short gray human, which was the most commonly described a full on human or a hybrid, all four of those, the first four categories are entirely human hominin entities just with various forms of, of evolutionary variation. So, yeah, I mean, we can look at things like that. We can do content analysis. We can do big data analyses. We can even, what I'd like to do some days is, is model our physiology, our morphological form into the future, see what we get. I, I did something similar to that in my first book. Uh, I used a geometric morphometric approach to shift between a, a fully uh, entirely male versus an entirely female skull because one dominant trend in recent hominin evolution ever since about 20 or 30,000 years ago is a shift toward craniofacial feminization where we all, males and females, start to look more like the females of our ancestors. And if that trend continues, what I found is that we have these big, round, medial-laterally expanded heads. The eyes start wrapping around. We have these small faces. We start to look more like the grays. So um, if that is a trend that continues into the future, based on this geometric morphometric analysis, it looked like that is something that would also help explain uh, why we might look like that, why they look like that, and why we may be related. Yeah, and, and I just had a thought then, if we're seeing different variations on what we would call the greys, could it be that we're being visited by them from different stages of the future? Oh yeah. We're, we're seeing the different evolution, evolutional steps of this this future entity absolutely yeah and, and that's that's what i argue in both my books i refer to it as temporal variation right now we have geographic variation we can see but that's also temporal in the sense that what we see is how those populations evolved in those regions over the last 200 to 300 thousand years so it's both and and with this uh, you know i i sort of delve into how much of it is continued geographic variation into the future or how much of it like you said is that temporal variation where we're coming back from different points in our future and therefore look different than one another and and that's another thing i overlooked in my first book because i was really just purely focused on these these archetypal gray aliens but left out the obvious fact that we'll probably be time traveling way before that and if they're able to reach this point in our present and previous points, then we already have time travel. We have time travel as far back as they can possibly reach because they could pick someone up from that time and move them to whenever the hell they wanted to. So I that seemed like an obvious omission to me once I started reading more reports and researching the second book where a lot of them are just humans. 
just like us, still not quite to the point where they're speaking telepathically, but speaking with vocalized speech. They have kitchens and bathrooms, and they're doing the same things that we do. They're seen exercising outside the craft, picking up grasshoppers to collect data about the environment, and they look exactly like us. So, so it made me realize that this is probably going to be happening much sooner than I previously thought. And um, yeah, I, I think it would also help explain why we see them more often based on the Dr. Edgar Mitchell free study is that if you have this point in time, we have temporal proximity to points closer to us where we're more obvious to them because we exist closer to them. The farther mm -hmm. out you get, with these more gray like beings or these more mantid or reptilian like creatures that are maybe in our very distant future, we're one tiny blip on their overall temporal spectrum. So we would expect therefore to see them less often. And I made the analogy recently with geographic variation, how you expect to see people in your neighborhood much more frequently than you do someone that lives in China or you know, Mozambique or, or Indonesia or something like that, simply because you move around in that space more often. So I think that could help ex account for, for that result in the, the free study as well. That makes so much sense. Yeah. That's a lot of food for thought in there. Um, I just wanted to move to something slightly off the topic of UFOs for a moment. And I just wondered if you'd looked into, and if so, what your thoughts are on, and I'll say this, Homo floresiensis. Because there seems to be somewhat of an anthropolog anthropological debate surrounding them. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know all about that one. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite anthropologists, Peter Brown, was deep, deep into that debate about whether it was a genetic deformity or island dwarfism. Um, that, yeah, that was raging when I was in grad school. And I used a lot of Peter Brown's data for my own dissertation research. And it was unavoidable you would eventually come across that but yeah even beyond that question they're a tremendously interesting group um they you know were doing cave paintings long before alaska uh which i just got to visit a couple of weeks Amazing. ago actually wow. it was kind of a, a bucket <laughs> list item the whole dordone region honestly is fantastic but getting to go there is a place of Know, researched and, and written about extensively. It was phenomenal. But yeah, like almost three times before the Lasco cave paintings were done, they were making um, pictures of little pigs and, and things like that. But um, yeah, no amazing group. Um, it's, it's so fun to imagine them running around and, you know, hunting little baby elephants, tiny island dwarfed elephants. And uh, yeah, a cool group of people for sure. They, they show up in my new book, too, because um, one of the first time periods visited by these future humans is 48,000 years ago in the Dordogne River Valley of uh, southern France and then also in Indonesia with uh, the Flores Hobbits Amazing. and other places. Wow, that's interesting. I'm just going to switch to a couple of questions before we, we start winding down here. I, I got a question from a, a follower on Twitter, and he said that in a recent interview, you expressed interest in possibly looking into the testimony of Dan Barish, a purported Area 51 whistleblower, which personally I think is quite controversial. But he did claim that the euphonauts were future human time travelers. So I just wondered if it is something that you'd looked into yet. I did, yeah. I mean, I, I looked into it again recently just because it did come up in that podcast. And I, I didn't really remember a lot during that. And then, yeah, I found it really hard to find any reliable sources. Um, and I, I feel like that was sort of an issue the first time too, which is why I was kind of wishy-washy on the whole subject in the last conversation about it. But even in, in looking again, uh, I, I don't know, like, like for instance, I saw claims that this Dan Burrish guy claims to have worked with this J-Rod that crashed in the Kingman crash, but that was in 1950, and Burrish wasn't even born until 1963, so I couldn't figure out how that could have happened. Um, unless, you know, he's time-traveling too, and if J-Rod's <laughs> a time-traveler, maybe maybe that, that all took place. But, no, it is interesting, you know, and there's obviously things that sync up with, what i'm saying but 
I'm, I'm not going to give them more credence because it happens to correlate with what I'm saying. I, I found it really difficult to find anything reliable. And then, you know, I was reading something about how J-Rod, you know, maybe died or got sent through a portal in Abydos, Egypt, which interestingly comes up a lot in the Om Seti case. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm still sitting high atop the fence on that one, dangling both legs on both sides. I don't think that's possible. One leg on either side, <laughs> I guess, is how that would work. Um, yeah, no, yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, is Dan Burr still alive? Why, why aren't people asking him these questions? I'm not like sure to be honest. Now. But it certainly was something that I encountered that that story in the earlier days of when I was first in this subject, and it, you know, it sounded so incredible, but then it did fall apart the sort of more you look into it. So, yeah, it and just... with many things, there could be elements of truth. And, sure, and and there's obviously there's no doubt that many things are intentionally muddied uh the rendlesham case was one of those you know they tried to take everybody's account and just mix them all up so nobody had the right date and time for anything and and they they, they did that intentionally they being the ones who have always known about this and have taken great measures to cover it up and confuse us and to keep it out of the, the mainstream cultural zeitgeist of any of these various periods so that that could have happened with the burrish case too um you just you never know we're not in a place where we can really say anything for sure right now yeah absolutely uh, i've got a question here from jason he asks if dr masters was tapped to join a team of time traveling scientists where would he go what would he want to learn and what experiments would he want to run um i actually would want to go to the future if I was taken aboard one of these alleged time machines, um, just to know, I mean, I wouldn't have to do anything. Wouldn't have to run any experiments. I could just go to the future after they already did all of that. Be like, okay, so what about <laughs> this? Well, what happened there? You know, is there a God? What's the beginning of the universe? What's the meaning of life? Are we in a simulation? You know, how's the hive mind consciousness work? How do you do that? You know, like all these things that I would love to know about um that you can't know from going backward but with that said i mean that was a big part about writing this most recent book which actually goes to uh be formatted tomorrow which is kind of exciting and would be out june 1st i think or slightly after that was a, a big part of it for me that's what kind of started it along with michael murphy's what about sex question is is where would I go? What would I be interested in? And I could kind of put myself in the mindset of these time travelers who come back from the future, pick me up, go to the past. You know, where, where are we going? What are we doing? Who are we encountering? What are we doing with them? Mm. Um, what are we learning from them? So, yeah, if that, I mean, I, I wrote, you know, a, a 350 page book answering that very question uh, that should be out in a couple of weeks. Fantastic. Well, listen, before I let you go, if you could just tell us about any future projects that you might be working on or anything that you think you'd like to, you know, to bring up. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, just uh, getting this last book out, a um, couple conferences. I'll be giving a talk in Phoenix next weekend, part of a MUFON event down there. Uh, the main MUFON symposium in August. Um, doing a couple documentary things, various TV things from time to time. Yeah, that's about it. Just, um, you know, talking to good folks like you and having conversations with, with good people with a lot of questions like we all have. So that's about it, really. Nah, it's much appreciated. I, I know everyone uh, loves listening to what you've got to say, and uh, I do too. And, and I really want to thank you for coming on today. It, it's always really fascinating. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vinny. It's always great talking to you as well. Thanks. And everyone that's in the live chat, thank you so much. You've all been uh, really calm, cool, collected, as always. And I really do appreciate that. I'm going to be back next week where Katie Howland will be returning to co host, and we'll be talking with veteran ufologist Alan Greenf Greenfield. I'm going to get that wrong now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, guys, see you next week and take care. Goodbye.